And oh, how he loves us so. Oh, how he loves us. How he loves us all. He is jealous for me. Loves like a hurricane. I am a tree bending beneath the weight of his wind and mercy. When all No, nothing is on fire. Uh, evidently, the heat had not kicked on, and I just kicked it on. So, as you know, that first time when it does. And so, uh, I was going to make a joke that the service is getting ready to, you know, get on fire here. You know, that's what the smell is. Yeah. You know, the flames are creeping up. So, uh, hey, just a few quick announcements. Uh, so, two things. I see in a bulletin. Uh, through our, our website, we are uh, going to be using, hopefully, a new uh, system to kind of be able to send out text and, and things like that a lot easier. Uh, but we are in need of some information. So Kathy has put a white sheet in your bulletins. This is one per family. Uh, so guys, so that we can read it, let your wives fill it out. Okay, uh, but if both people, just to make sure you both want to get text, if you'll put that down there, um, and then an email address, and then birth dates and anniversaries, uh, that would be very helpful. We're also just double-checking our um, uh, records to make sure that we have everything up to date. Uh, you see in the bulletin there uh, that there is a number... It's at 866-838-3192. Uh, that's where all the messages will come from. Uh, if you want to put that in, I put that in my phone. I saved it as a contact. I just put it in as NLBFC. Uh, that way when it pops up on your text messaging, you know what it is. Uh, that will make you don't think it's some kind of spam or something like that. If you need help putting a contact in your phone, uh, find one of the younger people around. They'll be able to help you, okay? Um, anybody under the age of 18 uh, will be able to help you do that. Uh, but we're going to be hopefully getting that set up and um, using that will make it a lot easier on us getting information out uh, to the congregation. Uh, you can put these in the offering plate at the end of the service, okay? Uh, also, trunk or treat. Uh, our annual trunk or treat will come up. It's going to be on the October the 30th. That's a Sunday afternoon. Uh, we're going to start at 5 o'clock. We're just doing trunks this year. Um, so please uh, start stocking up on candy. Um, and uh, we will have a sign-up sheet next week uh, for um, trunks. Uh, you can be as decorative as you want or just show up with your trunk open. Okay. Uh, but start stocking up, go by Sam's, get the big bags of candies. However you want to do it, you're, some of you are very creative. Uh, some of you are like me, and you rely on other people to be creative, okay? So, uh, but start to do that, uh, and we'll have some more information on that uh, next week. Uh, other than that, I think that's about it. So uh, we're going to open up in a word of, uh, open up with the uh, family of God, Jim. Stepping up in there and, and singing the songs. So see, I know who I know who to call on when I need no, a duet. No, no, so, no, no. right, right. No, that's no. what we can do. <laughs> no, but uh, I know, I know. So, <laughs> uh, I do have. Oh man, well thanks. I do have three three birthdays to announce. My mother-in-law Kathy had one on the. 28th, okay, she's not here, so, but anyway, Brenda had one on the 30th, right, and then Amelia has one tomorrow, so, 
Let's go ahead and sing them happy birthday since I missed it last week. So please stand and we'll sing happy birthday. Happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday, God bless you, happy birthday to you. So happy birthday, everybody. All right, now we'll start with Family of God. every situation. And God, we're just going to praise you for this time. And Lord, that ask that you would just watch over us, guide us, and direct us. And Lord, as we seek your word today, and that we would learn the lessons through hard times. And what that means. The trials and the tribulations. And God, we look forward to the time when you're stepping out. But until that time, you're called to call us to be faithful and true. And God, we thank you, Lord, for all that you're going to do. We're going to start off with him 448 just a closer walk with thee
the next one is hymn 410, as well with my soul. strengthen us, test our faith, you know, and, um, but as we go through those times, that's where he keeps making us, so th this is just a short little song, but it reminds me so much of when you're going through trials, that 
Just remember, he's still making us, and we're all works in progress. But that's just remember, he keeps making us. So, okay. can be healed cause I'm so callous now I can't feel I want to run to you with heart wide open make me broken you know that I am in the right book this week. Uh, so 1 Peter chapter 3, or chapter 4, I see, I can, I, I'm all flustered now. 1 Peter chapter 4, you know, there's many times in our lives, sometimes we, you know, you, you've seen where people will wave a white flag, you know, when they're uh, in, in, in movies where they're, you know, they want to stop something from happening. I was uh, listening to a game yesterday on the, on the, on the road home yesterday. Uh, and, you know, in football, when they either they kick off or they punt, sometimes the receiver will just wave his hands, you know, to, to signal that's going to be a, a fair catch, that nobody can tackle him. And sometimes we feel like we do that. We, we signal, okay, Okay, you know, I'm, I'm good. Nobody, nobody hit me. Okay, nobody tackle me. Okay. But then it just keeps on coming, all right? It just keeps on coming. You know, sometimes that's what we feel like. We just don't like, how many more people can pile on top of me before they realize I'm down? As we continue in our series of 1 Peter, 
seeking holiness in this hostile world. Uh, next Sunday, we'll look at the, the remaining of 1 Peter in chapter 5. But I hope something from this series has been encouraging to you in the times of trials. By the way, the word trial really kind of gives us the idea of being under the thumb. It's really what the word trial means. Many of us know the experience of what that feels like to have a thumb pressed down upon you for one reason or the other. Some of you are going through, like us, some unrelenting pressure right now. Keeps you awake at night, makes you feel wiped out during the day. In the New Testament, the word trial means to prove by testing. In other words, a trial demonstrated the genuineness of your faith in Christ and refines the quality of your spiritual life. So the trials we go through not only demonstrate the genuineness of our faith, but they refine us in our spiritual walk with the Lord. Trials allow God to adjust our conduct. At the deepest level, God is committed to, to reshaping our character to who we should be. And the only reason is for His glory. The hits of life, man, they sometimes they feel like they come fast. Or they can stretch over months or years or decades. Trials can be tiny and irritating, like when you get something in the corner of your eye and you just can't get it out. Or they could be a titanic and impossible to endure. They can involve the physical, the relational, the financial, the emotional, the circumstantial, or the spiritual. And I think there's several biblical terms Sometimes that we could use interchangeably, like suffering, hardship, tribulation, chastisement, or discipline. And I think as we look at 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 through 19 this morning, I want us to find four truths that will help us process our plan so that we can stay holy when everything is hostile around us. So if you turn to 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 through 19, and if you'll stand with me to honor the public reading of God's Word. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you, which comes upon you for your testing, as though some strange thing were happening to you. But to the degree that you share the suffering of Christ, keep on rejoicing, so that also at the revelation of his glory you may rejoice with exaltation. If you are reviled, For the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. Make sure that none of you suffers as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or a troublesome meddler. But if anyone suffers as a Christian, he is not to be ashamed, but is to glorify God in his name. For it is the time for judgment to begin with the household of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the outcome 
for those who do not obey the gospel of God. And if it is with difficulty that the righteous is saved, what will become of the godless man and the sinner? Therefore, those also who suffer according to the will of God shall entrust their souls to a faithful creator in doing what is right. God, I want to thank you for this day and the opportunity we have to see what it means and what lessons we can learn during the trials. God, as we'll walk away, that we can be able to say, I understand the trials of life and what my lessons will be. Not only to refine us, but to shape us. But God, help us to see you through everything today and this week and the weeks ahead and all that we're going to do. And God, I thank you for our time together today. And what a glorious time it is when we can all gather in your house and in your place. In your name we pray. Amen. I want us to see a couple things. First of all, in verse 12, we receive suffering. Peter writes to us, When we start to deal with that, with the problems and the pain and the persecution, is to receive the hard times that come our way. First Peter 4 says that we shouldn't be surprised by suffering. Suffering is the mark of discipleship. Something that is guaranteed for the follower of Christ. Peter starts out in verse 12. He says, Beloved, brothers, sisters, those who we prize so much as a family that we can come together. When we're suffering... It is easy to question God's love. Isn't it? It is. But we are beloved by God. Even when we are being bombarded by the garbage around us. When we're standing there going, okay, no more. White flag, I'm done. And man, it just they just keep on coming. It's like somebody's run over us with the bus. We're laying there. They put it in reverse, step on the gas back over us, hit it and drive, hit it again, and they just keep going back and forth. We are beloved. God treasures in the midst of trials, even if we don't feel it. Peter commands us, listen to verse 12 again. Do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you, which comes upon you from your testing as though some strange thing were happening to you. Let me put that in 2022. Why are you surprised that things are going crazy? I mean, basically, that's what Peter is saying. When people stand there and go, gosh, I didn't know there was going to be a trial in my life if I followed you. I mean, it's like, there's like, hello, you know, I feel like, you know, back to the future. Hello, McFly, you know, you know, tap you on the forehead. Why are you surprised, Peter says, when a trial comes? Peter says, it's not a strange thing. Even through suffering, often ambushes us in unexpected ways. We shouldn't be shocked. 
I mean, Paul said it in Acts chapter 9, verse 16. For I will show you how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. Peter calls it a fiery trial. Reminds us that its suffering is intense. We think of people around the world right now that are going through fiery trials. Sometimes as new Christians, confused when they think that everything should go perfectly. And even as seasoned Christians, sometimes we think, I'm just going to go through, there's no, I, I'm, on, I'm on cruise control. When put, you put your faith in Christ, it's not if you will experience pressures and persecutions. You will experience pressures and persecutions. Acts 14, verse 22 puts it the best. We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. You know, Jesus, you know, one of the ideas out there with, with some of these crazy people on TV is what's called the prosperity gospel. You just, everything is hunky-dory, you know, you give and God will give it back to you, you know, I'll sneeze, send me five bucks, I'll sneeze on my handkerchief and it'll be blessed for you kind of thing. Jesus never mentions that in Scripture. But you know what he does preach on? He preaches on the persecution gospel. Not this Tuesday, but the following Tuesday, we're going to be starting a series on Tuesday afternoons on the Beatitudes. And one of them is in Matthew chapter 5, verse 10. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. John Stott put it this way, that we should not be surprised when anti-Christian hostility increases, but rather be surprised if it doesn't. John records in chapter 15, verse 20, Jesus said, they persecuted me, they persecute you. John 16, 33 he goes on, in this world, you will have trouble. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12, Paul says to Timothy, In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. And Philippians tells us, in chapter 1, verse 29, For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but to also suffer for him. Now, I want to make an unsettling statement right now. Here it is. A faith that leaves us unprepared for suffering is a false faith that deserves to be lost. If you base your faith on a lack of afflictions, your faith lives on the brink of extinction and will fall apart because of some frightening diagnosis or a shattering phone call. Token faith will not survive suffering, nor should it. Believing God exists is not the same as trusting the God who exists. If at, just, and I'm, I'm, I'm being honest, at the first moment of trouble, we go, I'm out of here. What, what is that? What is that? When hard times come, we need to be a student and not a victim. We need to learn from God. We live in culture right now, especially the victim culture, where we have become experts at the blame game. A victim says, why'd this happen to me? 
A student says, I don't care why it happened. I just want to learn what God is trying to teach me. Peter goes on, secondly, in verses 13 through 14. Not only do we need to receive suffering, but we need to rejoice in suffering. Now some of you go, rejoice in suffering? Yeah, but listen to Peter. But to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing, so that also at the revelation of his glory you may rejoice with exaltation. If you are reviled for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. You know, I realize right now, some of you just heard what I said and go, it's pretty hard to rejoice sometimes. I, I, I understand that. I understand sometimes when we're being, in the, the word that's used in Scripture, reviled, attacked, beaten down, everybody's piling on top of you, it's hard to go, blessed be the name, blessed be the name. It's hard to do that. It's hard to stand and, and, and sing the songs we sung this morning. Oh, it is well with my soul. It's hard to sing that. You know, but here's the thing. It's impossible without God. Peter uses the word rejoice. He knows it's not going to come naturally, so he keeps repeating it, hoping that it will stick with us. Peter actually puts it in a context like this. He, instead of just saying rejoice, what he's actually implying is keep on rejoicing. Keep on rejoicing. If you are reproached for the name of Christ, he says, blessed are you. Real quickly, I think there are three reasons why we can rejoice in trials. And they're not up on the screen. I probably should have. One, we can rejoice because it deepens our fellowship with Christ. We are fellowshipping with the one who suffered the ultimate for us. Now, we, we experience trials and suffering, but we will never experience the trials and suffering that Christ did when he paid the cost for our sins. But our suffering joins us with Jesus in a way that nothing else can. Secondly, it deepens our joy as we prepare for his coming. Our study on Tuesdays about Revelation, it's all been about his coming. Suffering gets our focus ready for his appearing. The phrase glad with exceeding joy means that we are to leap with lively joy. And something supernatural happens when we suffer. But it also deepens our reliance on the Holy Spirit. You know, there's, there's not a day that we cannot go without first going, God, I need your Holy Spirit. I need your Holy Spirit. I need you. God's glory and his weighty reputation is literally the sum total of all his attributes. And we suffer, we somehow get to experience God resting on us. We are part of that, that shining tabernacle. Much like Stephen, when being persecuted, looked and he said, it's the face of the angel. We need to receive, enjoy, rejoice in suffering. But look at verse 15 through 16. We need to reflect on our suffering. 
Make sure that none of you suffers as a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, or a troublesome meddler. But, and I have verse 16 circled in my Bible. But if anyone suffers as a Christian, he is not to be ashamed, but is to glorify God in his name. Peter wants us to ponder why we're going through problems. Now, much like he said back in chapter 3. In verse 17, he said, For it is better if God should will it so that you suffer for doing what is right rather than doing what is wrong. Verse 16, 15 and 16 is very similar. Better to suffer for doing the right thing than it is for doing the wrong thing. Better to suffer as a Christian than it is to suffer because you are a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, or a troublesome meddler. Listen, I'm going to open up this way. We need to live for Christ and be ready to suffer as a Christian, and do not be ashamed. Paul says that in the beginning of Romans, chapter 1. For to me to live is Christ, but the different verse. But to me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. We need to remember that it is better to live for God and to do the right thing than it is to suffer for something that we did wrong. To stand for Christ, verse 16. To suffer as a Christian and to not be ashamed. We live in a culture, though, right now, where if you stand up and you say something about Christ or your beliefs in God, you're like, hey, you, you freaky kind of person. I'm glad. I'm glad. We say, well, Pastor, that's easy for you. No. It should be easy for all of us to say, as a Christian, this is what I believe. And I'm taking my stand. I'm taking my stand, and this is what I believe. We are to be the salt and the light. You know, Matthew tells us if the salt has lost its flavor, it's not good for anything. You know, before the days of refrigeration, they would put salt on, on things to preserve it. Keep it cool. Keep the salt on it. It would last longer. But if the salt's no good, it says we're to be the light. If the light goes out, what good is it? You think about the back in the day, it was, it was, it was candles and lamps that they would light. And if the, the candle burned out or the, the oil ran out of the lamp, what good is it? I mean, Randy knows what it means to have no power. What good is it to have all this stuff if we have no power? Some people experienced that this week with the storms. You know, what good is it to have a nice big TV, but you ain't have no power to watch TV with? Or to get on your Wi-Fi or your whatever it is. Or to charge your electric car if you have no power. I thought I might throw that one in there. We are to be the salt and the light in verse 16. If we suffer as a Christian, he is not to be ashamed, but is to glorify God in his name. Goes on, verse 17. For it is, it is time for judgment to begin 
with the household of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel? And if it is with difficulty that the righteous is saved, what will become of the godless man and the sinner? Peter's telling us, don't turn away. Rejoice in the suffering. The last look at verse 19. Rely on God when you suffer. Therefore, comes to his conclusion. Those also who suffer according to the will of God shall entrust their souls to a faithful creator in doing what is right. Peter tells us God's will is to rely on him. Uh, came across a video this week. If you go to our church website under sermons and resources, you'll under the resources tab, you'll see the video there. The title of the video, it's a little 10-minute video called God's Goodness in Your Pain. And basically, the sum of it says this. They argue that we need a robust view of the greatness of God in order to find solace in our suffering. God is sovereign and good even if I can't see or feel Him. One of the gentlemen puts it this way. God uses sorrowful tragedy to set the stage for surprising triumph. Whether in this life or the life to come, Tony Evans put it this way. Everything is either caused by God or allowed by God. There is not third category. Nothing comes to us that is not first filtered through the Father's loving hands. So here's my experience. When it comes to suffering, I basically had the same basic question most of us have, and that is, why? I remember sometimes going to Romans chapter 8, verse 28. God has created us for a purpose and for his purpose alone, and he would not let me go through any experience that did not have meaning for it. It was, it was a total giving up of self and circumstances and giving it all to God that brought relief. The will of God I could trust more than my own. When this happened, there was true peace, comfort, joy, and safety. Trials are designed to teach us so that our conduct and our character change. But the good news is this. The Bible is that God is a suffering God. He's right there. Jesus died a horrible death on a rough cross to provide you with the ultimate solution for suffering. A time to come to Him. Probably some of us will relate to this illustration. A teenager didn't want to be seen in public with her mother. Now, the, the illustration goes on, okay? So don't, I'm not stopping there. Did not want to see her in public with her mother because her hands and arms were horribly disfigured. One day when her mom took her shopping and reached out her hand, a store clerk looked horrified. When they got back to the car, the girl started crying and told her mother how embarrassed she was to be seen with her. The mother waited an hour before going to her daughter's room to tell her for the first time what happened. When you were a baby, I woke up to a house. The room was an inferno. Flames were everywhere. I had 
I could have gotten out the front door, but I decided I'd rather die with you than leave you to die alone. I ran through the fire, arms around you. Then I went back through the flames with my arm on fire. When I got outside on the lawn, the pain was agonizing. When I looked at you, you was rejoiced that the flame had not touched you. Done, the girl looked at her mom through new eyes, weeping, shame, and gratitude. She kissed her mom, smarred hands and arms. That's what God is like. God has taken us through the flames so that we don't have to be burned by the flames, but we can rejoice in all that he is. And in our faith, in our times, we understand of what God is doing, and we need to rejoice in the suffering that we experience. And verse 16 again, if we suffer as Christians... Do not be ashamed. But we are to glorify God in his name. You know, we think about the lessons of hard times. Those trials are designed so that our conduct and character are changed. And we need to rejoice in what God is doing. In this hostile world, as we seek him, let us rejoice in everything that we have, everything that we do. Help us to see him through every situation. And ask God to guide us and direct us. I'm going to ask everybody to bow their heads and close their eyes. Jimmy's going to come in just a second. And what a wonderful song without him. You may say, my trials and struggles are terrible right now. And that may be true, but I can guarantee you one thing. Without Him, it's impossible. But with Him, all things are possible. As a church, I just ask us today, whatever trials we're going through, whatever tribulations we're going through, whatever struggles we're going through, you would just turn to God and just rely on Him. Rejoice when you feel like you're being pushed down and tackled upon and you're waving the white flag but no one's stopping. Rejoice. Remember Psalms 40 that God put a new song in your mouth and lifted you up out of the mire. Rejoice in the times of what God is doing. Have a song of praise. No matter what it is, God is moving, God is directing, and God is guiding. God, I thank you, Lord, for what you do. We're going to praise you for who you are. Help us right now to see you every situation. To rejoice in that struggle and that trial and that suffering. And God, that we'll say, without you, God, it's horrible. But God, with you, what a rejoicing we'll have. God, I thank you, Lord, for this time. I thank you for this day. Praise you for who you are. And ask you to just guide us and direct us. Help us to rejoice in all that we're doing each and every day. God, thank you for this time and this place. In your name we pray. Amen. Jimmy, let's stand and sing.